My name is Louis Dijkstra. I'm the Deputy Head of the Economic Analysis Unit in the DG for Regional and Urban Policy in the European Commission. And I want to tell you a story about Broadville and Narrowtown, because that tells you why we need a global, people-based definition of cities and settlements. So in my lecture, I'm going to tell you about two mayors. One is the mayor of Broadville, he's called Brad, and one is the mayor of Narrowtown, she's called Nancy. And they try and compare each other's cities and learn from each other, but there are some problems. And what are the causes of these problems? It's the varying sizes of municipalities. And I'll give you a concrete example of that. But we want to overcome this problem. And so we have a new tool called the population grid, which helps us to overcome the problem and two definitions I want to tell you about. And so we want to use this for the globe and even test it and get your feedback on how that can work. Broadville is a very large municipality. It encompasses the central city center, but also the suburbs, some towns, and some further away rural areas. Narrowtown is much smaller. It only has a little part of the city center, and it doesn't include the suburbs, the surrounding towns, or rural areas. So, over time, people move out of the city center into the suburbs, and some of the farther outlying towns and rural areas are growing. Now, what does that mean for Brad and Nancy? Brad, mayor of Broadville, thinks he's a mayor of 600,000 people. He thinks the density of his city is low, air pollution is low, and access to public transport is not great. But there's a lot of open space, and population change is positive. There's growth. Land use growth is also quite rapid. Nancy, mayor of Narrowtown, thinks she's a mayor of a city of 150,000 people. Density is very high, air pollution is high, fortunately access to public transport is excellent, but there's not a lot of open space, and population change is negative, there's decline, and land use growth, well, there's so much built up area, they can't build anymore. So as a result, these two mayors think they are mayors of radically different cities, but in reality, they are very, very similar, they are just different boundaries on the same type of city. And this is important because many of the indicators behind the Urban Sustainable Development Goal are very sensitive to where you draw the boundary of your cities. For example, access to public transport. It'll be high if you have a very tight definition of your city, but it'll be much lower if the boundary is further out. The same is true for the ratio of land consumption relative to population growth, air pollution, or the average share of built-up area that's open space for public use. So that's why we want to find a better way of defining your city. One of the big problems of defining a city is that because some municipalities are large, we lose the city in it if you use the density to define your city. For example, Badajoz in Spain is a city of 120,000 inhabitants. Average neighborhood density is quite high, almost 10,000 inhabitants per square kilometer. However, the municipality as a whole, because it's so large, only has a density of 100 inhabitants per square kilometer. So how can we fix this? We need units of the same size. Here on the slide you can see population density on the left of municipalities and then population density of a population grid, all little squares of one square kilometer, on the right hand side. On the left hand side you can see two red circles. One identifies a clear high density settlement and the other one shows really nothing at all. But if you look at the grid, you can see those two red circles and two distinct settlements there. So the grid helps you find cities like Badajoz. So we got together with the OECD to create what we call a functional urban area definition. It uses three concepts. The first is an urban center. This is based on the population grid. We take every grid cell that has at least 1,500 inhabitants in it and glue it together with other high density grid cells. In that cluster of grid cells, we need at least 50,000 inhabitants. If that is found, we have an urban center, and I'll show you in a second how it's done. Once we have that urban center, we need to turn it into a city. So we find all the municipalities that have at least 50% of their population in that urban center, and together they form a city. But of course, a city is not independent. It has a lot of economic links with the surrounding areas, so we need to create a commuting zone. Every municipality that sends 15% of their employed population to that city is considered a part of the commuting zone. City plus commuting zone is a functional urban area. Let me show you how it's done. Here you see a representation of Graz in Austria. On the left, we found all the high density cells with at least 1,500 inhabitants. 
Then next to it, we dropped the smaller ones and glued the rest together because there, there's at least 50,000 inhabitants. And then we found the municipality with at least half its population in that urban center. And then it becomes a city. So after we create a city, we create a commuting zone. These are all the municipalities that send 15% of their employed population to that city. Here you can see an example of Genova in Italy, where we see in light pink all the municipalities that have that share, and then we fill the gaps, we drop the non-contiguous ones, and we have a commuting zone. However, to apply this to the globe, we have two issues. The first one is commuting data is hard to find, not just in low-income countries, in all countries. And the EU OECD definition doesn't cover smaller settlements, so we need to look further. We have in the EU a definition called the degree of urbanization. It uses the same definition of cities as in the EU OECD definition, but it also identifies towns and suburbs. Towns can be used to identify smaller settlements, and suburbs can be linked to adjacent cities to create a proxy for that functional urban area we just saw. So, how does the degree of urbanization work? It is based on one kilometer population grid, just like before, and it has three grid concepts. You already know the urban center, but now you will learn about the urban cluster and the rural grid cell. These three grid concepts are translated into three types of municipalities. City, towns and suburbs, and rural areas. Let me show you how. So for the types of grid cells, you have urban centers, which I already explained, then the urban clusters. These use a lower density, not 1500, but 300. And they use a lower minimum population threshold, not 50,000, but 5,000. And so together, these create urban clusters. And then all the cells around those are rural grid cells. How do we translate that into municipalities? You already know, 50% of population in an urban center means a city. 50% 50 of your population in urban clusters, but not a city, it means you're a town or a suburb. 50% of your population in a rural grid cell, it means you're a rural area. And what are urban areas? Well, urban areas are cities plus towns and suburbs. Now, let me give you a concrete example. Here you can see Cork, it's a land use map. In the center, you can see the big city, and surround it, you see some suburbs, smaller towns, and rural areas. But you don't know how many people live there, so you need something else. This is what a population grid looks like. And again, you can see the big dense center in the middle and some smaller towns on the outskirts. We translate this into our three grid concepts, urban center, urban cluster, and rural grid cells. And you can clearly see Cork in the middle in bright red, some suburbs in yellow around it, and some separate towns also in yellow. And then the rest is rural areas. We translate this into municipalities. And so now you have three categories, cities, towns and suburbs, and rural areas. So what can we learn from this data? We can compare it with the data in the world urbanization prospects. Overall, the EU is about similar in terms of share of urban population, 74% compared to 72. Not so different, you say. However, if you look at some specific countries, you'll find very big differences. Denmark, for example, reports 88% urban, whereas we only find 52. Belgium reports 98% urban, where we find only 82%. So here you see the impact of national definitions versus a harmonized definition. Comparing this at the global level is harder. We first had to create a new open access global population grid. And we've only been able to test it up to the grid level. We haven't been able to match these three grid concepts with the municipalities. The results are only draft, and clearly they can still be improved, but I think the results are already very interesting. So let me quickly explain to you how we created a global population grid. Using satellite imagery, we try to detect every single building in the world. And for each little grid cell, we decided how much of that land was covered by buildings. And then from census data, we got population for little administrative areas. And by combining this one with the built-up area, we were able to create a population grid. To put it simply, we took the people, put them in a building, and ta-da, we have a population grid. What does this show at the global level? Well, at the global level, we have a bit of a difference. We've all heard the news, 50% lives in urban area. Our data shows 85% lives in urban areas, so there's a bit of a difference there. I think the difference is to do with whether we're talking about cities 
big places, or towns and suburbs, smaller places, because our share in cities is almost exactly 50%. So where are the differences biggest? Africa and Asia. Africa, according to the World Urbanization Prospects, is only 40% urban. We found over 80%. Asia, almost 50% urban, according to the World Urbanization Prospects. We found almost 90%. So clearly, again, we find big differences when we use harmonized data as compared to national data. So one of the big differences in these national definitions is the population threshold. Some use 200 as a minimum population, others use 50,000. Already you can see what definition you use will change the numbers. It's also not entirely clear how often these definitions have been updated. As places change, they may have become urban, but are still classified as rural. Some countries don't report the definition they use, and some just use a list of places which have a political status as a city, but not necessarily using a statistical definition. Of course, our data is not without flaws, and some of the problems can be created if population is not reported accurately, if the building detection doesn't work properly and over or underestimates population in some places, and also the way we combine these two data sources may still be able to be improved. To conclude, to help mayors like Brad and Nancy learn from each other, we need that global, people-based definition of cities and settlements. The OECD, the World Bank, and the European Union have joined forces and committed at the Habitat 3 conference to develop exactly that definition together. The first results of applying the degree of urbanization to the globe have already been produced. You can learn more about them from the State of European Cities report and also from the Atlas of the Human Planet. These results can also be interrogated interactively online and you can find the link here. So what are the next steps? We want to present the results to as many stakeholders as possible to get your feedback on the results and the method. We want to match these grid concepts with the municipalities so we can identify the political responsibles for these cities and suburbs. We want to improve the data we're using by using higher resolution satellite data. And we also want to test this method, not just on our data, but also on your data. So we really need your input. So please visit our website. You'll be able to look exactly at your city and see how we define the cities, the suburbs, and the rural areas. You can even go back to 1975 to see what it looked like then. And so the goal of this work is to present a final methodology to identify cities and settlements in the world to the UN. Thank you very much.